can i yeah oh. i'm going on a very good morning to one and all i am dheeraj chawa i triple computer society chair my hearty welcome to each and every participant attending this webinar special thanks to our speaker mr sushil kaspleti is also the founder and ceo of braggy it's a privilege to have you here sushil i also thank our faculty advisor kmbb prasad sir and i triple hyderabad section i triple hyderabad computer society i'd also like to thank i triple shri student branch for giving us this opportunity and again like to thank our hod's college college management principal sir for their constant support sushil kaspleti over to you now right uh, thank you dheeraj thank you mansura the great opportunity really <clears throat> so i just wanted to get started so you guys recommend we wait for a few minutes or should i just get started yeah you can go for uh, yeah. since meanwhile the participants may also enter all right so <clears throat> so the entire session really is uh, you know built on the fact that i feel that a lot of people who approach me uh, with coding advice okay uh this starts quite often right people start approaching me as soon as summer or some long vacation starts they start approaching they are like bro how do i start coding you know i want to learn this or right before exam some people approach me and they'll ask me how do i get started and all that so the session is really to find out you know how best to maximize your coding learning capabilities even if you're in college or not you're not in college okay that is the primary focus the target audience is really engineering students or anyone who wants to learn to code all right so now that we have that out of the way i just wanted to give you some brief introduction on the market before we get started all right so if you guys have any questions leave them in the chat and towards the end me and mysura will be doing a question hour okay there i'll answer all your questions one by one and then we can uh, turn on our mics and we can talk to each other as well if you know text isn't enough to get the question through all right so everybody is able to hear right what i'm saying okay i'll take that as a yes fine uh mysura please stay in the chat with me so that we can communicate if anything is necessary all right so i'll just get started all right so i hope everyone can everyone can see my screen right all right so the first thing the main premise of this video is that whenever someone approaches i feel that they either come with two notions okay you want to learn coding for the academic purposes that is you are in college and next day or sometime you have an exam or something going on so you want to learn a particular topic or particular concept quickly so then you'll get videos from my side that is usually what happens something that i refer to the other side is people who are actually interested in building some application you know or you want to work on your startup or you want to work in someone else's startup or you want an internship so you're trying to brush up on something you're trying to learn so real premise is that a lot of people don't really know what to choose when they start coding okay so here's the meme really or cartoon in this case because this is quite old the premise being that effort plus wrong tools is not equal to success all right so in this case we have a uh, you know builder who's actually using a drill to hammer in a nail okay anyone who knows anything about tools knows that this is completely wrong in most cases the drill is not even sturdy enough to uh, bear the impact it probably start cracking or breaking all right you need an actual hammer for the job the same case is with programming okay when you go into college really college uh, is tuned towards academic purposes okay they have academic goals where computer science is not you no know, uh, coding itself is not computer science it's a subset of computer science in computer science we really we cover a lot of theoretical subjects theoretical subjects like operating systems you know how your operating system really works database systems the amount of coding you learn is probably 10% of the entire syllabus really even the grade points if you look at it the grade points are not evenly balanced you would mostly think it would be very practical but it is a lot of theory because people do not learn the theory and that theory is important all right so that is the main premise of this video that i want you guys to take home this one point if you are not able to keep through with the entire session okay this will be an entire overview of coding as a whole how many platforms you can code for what kind of languages do what what frameworks do what okay, this will be an overview video but the real point i want you to take home end of the day is that programming is not a subject it is not a stream it is a language it is a tool okay it is a tool finally just like mathematics mathematics after a while you know once we get into engineering we really start understanding what what math is really right it's more of a tool because in every subject 
math starts getting involved, but not on a high level. The math problems that you solved until 11th and 12th in calculus and all that are very simple compared to the problems you're using math to solve in physics and chemistry. You know, chemistry balancing equations, calculating reagents and then temperatures and all that. You just have fixed formulas. You have to apply some math over there. Some cases you have some statistics or calculus and all. So that is how programming is really. Your other domain knowledge, you can implement that using program. Okay. So we'll just get started. Okay. So I think uh, Maestro, we'll, we'll get started with the main session already. Right? I'm done with the introductory parts. Yes. So before that, I wanted to convey one more thing. See, uh, right now, whenever someone starts learning to code, there, there, there are two things that I see again. You know, you learn it for academic purposes and then you learn it for yourself. But there's one real big problem in approach. A lot of people who want to uh, learn to code usually started by the time they're in college or too late into their life really. Okay, you started at college level, which is like around 17 or 18 by then. So a lot of these people haven't really used computers uh, for the better part of their lives, apart from you know some people who probably played games in their childhood. It's not familiar with the computer itself. And then a lot of people who come to me usually tell me that they can't manage to sit on the computer for a long time. Now they're like, more than one hour is really stressful for me. But when uh, you can sit on your phone, uh, the common uh, you know, retort to that is that you can sit on your phone for hours. You know, uh, Some of us spend six, seven hours a day on the phone itself. So people assume that, okay, if I'm able to bring my learning experiences, you know, we have apps like Baiju's, Khan Academy, all that, which is actually available on the phone. So the same assumption just applies that, you know, if I could uh, move my programming, learning uh, curriculum and everything onto my phone, because I spend a lot of time on my phone, that'll be excellent. That is not really the case. See, you could watch a few tutorials on your phone. That is completely fine. But the thing is, when you come to application of the code, like you have to execute the code, I find that people use online compilers and compiler apps on their mobile phone. That is not a practice that I would recommend. Like if you're away, you know, away from home, you don't have access to your system for some reason, then you can brush up a few videos. But do not try to finish entire tutorials or Coursera courses over the phone because it's not really the ideal environment to get started with coding. Okay. And now, even the current uh, pandemic that we are in, you know, with coronavirus everywhere, lockdown going on, every software company has really moved into work from home. So, all right, so every company has really moved into the work from home thing, so they work from uh, remotely. Now, earlier, you know, if you went to an interview, okay, you can see this assumption that, all right. <clears throat> people had this assumption that, you know, if my resume had a lot of programming languages, okay, a lot of people uh, you know, usually are like, you know, if you know 10, 20 languages, you have a lot of scope, a lot of companies can find their right set of programming languages and they can find your job quickly. That uh, policy probably works in other fields, you know, if you're like a, a doctor with multiple specializations, then you have a lot of value. If you're a programmer with a lot of specializations, you have to again prove it as well. So your interview process will be different from those people if you claim to know a lot of languages. So the real uh, part where you have to stress on is mastering a few languages for the right purpose. All right. I hope that is clear to everyone. So right now, the job scenario is going to change after the lockdown, whenever that is lifted really, is that uh, coding interviews and everything already have been become very remote. Exams and everything, you know, most of the interview process has been cut down slowly. The exams have become less offline, they're more online now, with the expert tracking through the webcam and everything, so you don't cheat. So right now, your competition is not really from the area you live in. Suppose you all live in Hyderabad. The people who apply for Google in Hyderabad are not strictly people from Hyderabad. Now, it could be anyone from any corner of the planet. Your competition is anyone. Okay, anyone who can work remotely better than you is your competition by default. So things like body language, you know, communication skills, all of these play a minor role now when it comes to remote work. If you go for office work, those things play a major role. Now the thing is people don't really look at that. It's like, how do you work effectively remotely? It's like, uh, we all know chat communication is highly informal. When it comes to mail, to some extent, we maintain some level of formality. So this is how trends are moving really. So you have to work on getting more and more practical skills instead of you know theoretical skills. Like I know machine learning on a theoretical level, I can explain you any topic, but you have projects that you've implemented that has a lot of value. All right, this is what I wanted to tell you. So over time, what I want to uh, 
emphasize is that please do not spend your resources or time on a mobile phone to learn programming. Okay, if possible, invest in a good laptop or a desktop. You know, pick that. It'll always help you because later on, what will happen is when companies start recruiting after this lockdown period is done, they'll ask you if you have a good computer at home to you know prove. I mean, so that you can execute the programs that you claim to know. Okay, the languages that you know. Suppose you know machine learning. So that you can't execute that really on a very basic system unless you're using Google Cloud or something like that or Colab. So you need a powerful system. So this is how requirements go on, and then companies can't. Not all companies can provide you with their own office laptops now because this entire you know delivering something to your home concept is in disarray right now. So you have to think of all that. So probably try to invest in good hardware right now because that is that will really dictate the quality of code you write and your future and your flexibility as a program. All right, so th these are the points that I wanted to tell you because these points will again shape how you work towards programming and your approach towards it. Anyways, we'll get started. All right, just a second. So, getting started with programming, really, I'll give you an overview of programming as a whole. Okay, everybody is familiar with the uh, four platforms that are majorly dominant on the internet. All right, the four platforms being you know, the web the desktop, mobile, and others. Okay. In the web, it's like, you know, um, because this batch is mostly one, two years, you know, either one year ahead of me or two years behind me in terms of years. So all of us at some point have used Facebook and Google off of the desktop or laptop uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Right now, everything is over the mobile phone. Okay. So these are the platforms you can code for strictly. And today we'll have an overview of how, what kind of frameworks or tools you can pick so that you can start getting, you know, uh, getting started with coding and all that for these platforms instead of learning something that you don't really understand. Because uh, let's just face it, uh, when you go into college uh, in a computer science degree, you are given three pro programming languages in total in the first two years itself. The first one is C programming. This is where most of the effort goes into because this is where all the foundations and all that start. So you have a lot of theory and new uh, terms being thrown at you. So that is one problem. Once you clear C, once you start understanding what C is really about and start implementing a few projects, then you have a clarity of what to do. So then next they teach you Java because Java is more net oriented because it has a few other, you know, good packages involved. You can connect to databases and all that. You can uh, write applications with proper user interfaces and all that. Then they teach you C++. Okay, th these two are usually taught in the same semester, C++ and Java, or one semester after the other. C++ is more like the upgraded version of C where it has a few other features that makes it much more you know, applicable for writing quality code. Anyway, discussing the merits of an individual programming language is not the objective of this webinar. The objective being, I'll, let you, I'll give you enough information so that you can choose the right programming language. Anyways, after this video is done, in the show notes, I'll be providing this document here. This document will be accessible over the internet. This document is completely interactive. This is basically like a website, okay? So whenever I click on the links here, it automatically take you to the write-up that I have prepared for you, along with links to uh, you know tutorials and explanatory videos that I refer to myself, and they've given me good success lately. So anyways, before we get started with coding again, okay, there's a lot of before, before, before in this video, because I want to drive home that mindset that you need to develop, you know, uh, to get started with coding, because that is, that is where I feel most of the effort goes away because people just blindly start learning and then after a while they lose motivation because programming like any other subject which is new to you will have a lot of dry concepts and programming is not something that you'll find everyone around you doing at an effective level where they can teach you properly all right so one thing is before you build anything you have to ask yourself two questions really why should you build something and with what should you build it with what you should build something that we'll get to that later but why should you build something? A lot of people, you know, they, uh, you might be learning to course or you can crack exams. You know, you have PCS Ninja and all those exams really. They require a lot of coding skills. So you might be learning for that. Okay, there's nothing wrong with preparing for competitive exams. But if you're learning it purely for that matter, it is uh, going to end up like your math paper. Some of us love math, some of us don't like math because math is like, involves a lot of practice, you know, for. Even one simple concept, you have to do a lot of practice so you get used to it. You know, immediately you see the sum, you can like imagine all the steps in your head, they'll be playing out and then you can start solving. So coding becomes that way because your exams, really most of the questions that come in your exams, you know, competitive exams or your final exams in college, 
they, most of it, you know, 90% of the questions will be from the portion that you have covered already. Okay. So you're not really inventing anything new. You're not forcing your brain to think differently. So what I say is that you have to choose a project, a pet project. It, it need not be, you know, the next Google or Facebook or something completely game changing. It could be a very simple application that you wanted to build. Usually I find that people like to build games because that is the most fun way because games in the sense you can add more features. You've played a lot of games over your lifetime. So you would want to add this or that. Okay. Probably you want to add group chats, guilds, whatever you want. So that is where a lot of creativity flows. You have to let your creativity flow and dictate what you want to do next. So as you add more requirements to your project, so if you want to add personal chat or private chat or private messaging to your uh, video game, then you'll learn a few network infrastructures like, you know, socket IO and all that, some libraries that help you integrate chat into your platform, or you can do that from scratch. So this is what will be driving your learning processes. Don't strictly base your learning processes on the fact that, you know, you're portion dictates you to go this way because syllabus is really to give you an overview of what you can achieve with computer science. Syllabus will not dictate your entire knowledge, uh, you know, domain of computer science. It's just a starting point. From there, you're start, supposed to start exploring. That is the reason why we do minor projects and major projects as well. So we start applying our skills, you know, whatever you learned so far in real time. And when you try building something really, even if you try building a, a hotel management software or a hostel management software, you'll see that a lot of new concept, uh, concepts have to be applied in real time. This is where your creativity starts flowing really and you start exploring more and more options. Then you start finding shortcuts because implementing the same code over and over again over time becomes tedious. So you'll be like, okay, what if I could automate this or this part of my coding workflow is very, very... Uh, just a second. <laughs> So just a second, um, where was I? All right. You can't really, uh, uh, determine what you want to do next. Okay. If you do not pick a project or something, you need a driving force because this gets very dry over time. So with that driving force, even if you lose motivation, you still have something that you want to do. And people around you will also force you to do that because they know there was something driving you and today you're feeling low so you can start working on it. The next part is what do you want to build? Okay, once you have this motivation, you need to have the motivation to build something. And once you have this clear in your mind that you're going to build something, you have to determine what you want. Okay, for this step, okay, suppose you have the same kind of mindset right now as well. Just grab a piece of paper during this live session, okay, and jot down, you know, these points that I tell you. So you have to prepare a checklist, all right, to execute your idea, what exactly do you need? Okay, so let's take my example. Okay. I'm in my third year right now, third year, second semester. So they've given us minor project guidelines. So I decided I want to build, um, let's see, I want to build a chatbot. Okay. I'm sure everybody's familiar with what a chatbot is. It's like, you know, Google assistant, Siri, Ike, Natasha and all that. So once I decided what I want to build, I need to know uh, where my customers are or my target users are, where are my target audiences. So will it be on a desktop? Will it be websites? Will it be mobile apps? Okay. This entire demo is interactive. So you can just ch uh, check whatever you want in your project. So I decide I want to learn, I want to make a website for mine and then I want to make a desktop app and just a second. All right. So I decide I want to make a website. I want to make a desktop app and because most of, because my system is a windows business uh, system. So I want windows support. I don't really use a Mac. So, and I don't think a lot of people in my circles use a Mac. So I won't make an app for Mac. The next I'll make something for mobile, obviously, because half of the time I'm, I'm on the phone as well. So I'll make one for Android and iOS. So you create this checklist. Okay. Once you create this checklist, please take all, all these options. And then next you press the option right next to it. So first, uh, you know, you want to start with web development and this takes you to, uh, to the write-up that I've again provided. So I want you to fo follow this interactive way. So do you know exactly what all you're supposed to learn? Okay. My write-up will tell you exactly what to choose or what is best for your case or how best to continue from there. <clears throat> all right. Before we get into all of these technologies, all of these platforms, we need to get two pieces of information clear. Okay. Two fundamentals that we need to get clear are front end and back end. 
Okay, front end, this is common to all applications. You write it for a desktop, you write it for a PC, you write it for a VR game, anything. Front end and back end are two concepts that you'll hear everywhere. So front end is basically the look and feel, you know, only the pure user interface. Okay, only the design of it. Okay, and back end is where the logic is, you know, your uh, for loops, while loops, whatever logic you want, actual coding goes into the back end. So that is a concept. Okay, we'll get more into it as we go into it. Next is the web. Okay, so we'll start with the programming languages. So I just have a few images that I wanted to show you to really drive home what each uh, web technology does really. So in the web, okay, I think most of the people want to start building websites because you have the assumption that a website is access accessible over the internet to anyone. So once you make a website, you can share it with everyone. Instead of, you know, if you write a C program and you send it to your auntie or your grandfather and you're like, please look at my C program. You have to al also send them instructions to compile and execute that C program. Or if you're sending a Java program, then you have to send commands like, please first install Java NetBeans, then go with Java C uh, space program name, then Java followed by class name. That is a lot of inconveniences. So people start with web development usually. And in web development really, you always will encounter these three no matter at which level of uh, web development you are. It's HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay. HTML, most of us understand. I'll just give you an analogy to wrap your head around HTML, CSS, and JavaScript together at once. So assume that you're a person. You as a person, if I were to represent you as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, HTML is like your skeleton. You know, what gives your body that structure, okay? So how tall you are and all that, how long your arms are or fingers are, that is what is dictated by your skeleton. That is HTML in this case. Then CSS will be your skin, you know, your hair and all the features that really determine how you look, you know, your looks and all that is determined by CSS in this. Then JavaScript is all about, you know, the brain, the central nervous system, you know, what is really driving your body, what is causing it to move, what is, it, what is causing it to think and all that, all that logic comes from JavaScript. So that is how you would, uh, you know, anthropomorphize a website and a human body with HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So plainly looking at HTML, if you've started HTML at some point of time, I'm pretty sure most of us have it in second year or something like that, or we've tried it before. So raw HTML will always look like this. You know, it'll look unstructured and very plain looking. Some people call it ugly as well. I would call it ugly. Uh, so this is actually Google from 1991. There is some CSS involved here, but this is a basic example I wanted to tell you. This is how it would look normally if you just use HTML. And when you come to CSS, what CSS allows you to do really CSS literally stands for cascading style sheets. So you just write styles. So you're like, okay, look at this button over here. This button that says Google search is the same as this button that says Google search. Okay, the I'm feeling lucky and I'm feeling lucky are common. And the Google logo has changed. That is a design change. Okay, That is the image that has been changed. Just observe these two buttons. Look at how different in style they are. Okay, The one from the just HTML one has rounded corners. Okay, it looks embodied in some way. And when you come to this one, uh, you know, this is actually from 2018. This is much more flat and clean looking. That is the aesthetic they went with. Using uh, CSS, you can really uh, determine and you can tell the browser exactly how you want your, uh, what do you say, uh, components to look like. So if you want a button, you're going to tell it, okay, I don't want borders on my button. Okay, these borders look ugly, suppose. So I don't want borders at all. Make it very so uh, soft shadows. Please add soft shadows, okay. And then I don't want shadows altogether. Move the shadows. Okay. And then you think that, you know, search box, let's add a drop shadow at the bottom. Let's add a shadow so it looks different from the page because it has a white background. And then I can change my text color. So that is how CSS works. It just adds beauty on top of it. And you can add some animations as well. So you can make the Google logo wobble and all that. Okay. You can make it move back and forth using animations in CSS. It's pretty simple. And then we'll get into, you know, uh, some ways you can automate CSS or you can write less CSS and, you know, drag and drop some CSS to make your site look beautiful from the get go. Then coming to JavaScript, this is the, uh, you know, the best way I could tell you. So in the Google homepage, you usually have a mic on the site like here. And when you press the mic, it opens a button and then you can speak into it and it will do, you know, it will send uh, whatever you said, the audio transcript is sent to a server, which is the back end here. What are we looking at over here is the front end. You no, know, all of this is just the front end. Okay. So it'll send the audio clipping to the server. On the server, there is some machine learning done. So it, uh, it, it does speech to text conversion. Once the text is, uh, once they get the text. Okay. So I said, uh, in this case, they are saying Facebook. 
that Facebook has detected from the speech. And then that is run through Google's algorithm so that you can get Google uh, search results. And that using JavaScript will be returned from the server. You know, the server uh, <clears throat> sends back information. That information is returned and it is displayed on the website. Okay, that is what JavaScript is for running all of these application logics, really. Okay, so suppose you press the button, uh, suppose you press a like button. Okay, you press a like button. What happens is the like count before that, it has to be incremented by one. This kind of programming language logic that we are already familiar with, running loops, incrementation, decrementation, all of this is possible through JavaScript because HTML and CSS are not really programming languages. They're more for structuring your documents or this is how it looks. Without JavaScript, really, I, uh, if you wanted me to define what a website is, I would say it is a fancy Word document because a Word document doesn't do much beyond looking pretty and representing your information. JavaScript will really add all the actions, phase transitions, and all of that. All right. So now uh, most uh, web developers are held back by one thing. If you if you're learning, uh, you know HTML and CSS really, you feel that HTML is very easy. CSS has a lot of complicated uh, nonsense that most people don't understand called grids and all that, aligning your components to make sure they don't look ugly and all that. So there are some libraries that you can have a look at over here. These are in order of my preference and they're really convenient as well. So first one is Bootstrap. Okay. Bootstrap is basically like this. I'll just show you one second. Right. So these are all libraries. So they'll already have, what do you say? Code ready for you. All you have to do is download the code. Okay, drop the CSS files into your project folder. And then you just have to follow some, what do you say? Uh, syntax so that you can implement your buttons this way. Suppose we go for buttons over here. Okay, go for buttons. All right. So look at this button and compare it with this button over here, over here. All right. How different do they look? All you have to do is add some extra tags to your uh, HTML code so it recognizes where to take the CSS from. This is how these libraries work. All of them are the same. Okay. All of them have different styles. Really. Now coming to something called Material UI. This is what I use for my uh, websites. All right. So here you'll see that you know the buttons are different from bootstrap. They look different. All right. These buttons look different. They look more like what they would on Android, you know, your Google apps, calendar and all that. They have this kind of style. Go. All right. So this is for the people who want to make websites that look good on PC, as well as, you know, if you open it on your desktop on a wide monitor, or if you open it on your phone, which has, you know, a uh, uh, vertical screen, you know, vertically scaling screen. If you want it to look more like an Android app, okay, we'll get into that later where you can make your website behave like an Android or iOS app and the user can't tell the difference, but you would end up writing only a website. I mean, get there as well. These are really where you can just drag and drop, you know, files, uh, CSS files that have been written by the community with lots of support and lots of functionality, you know, and improving your website quality immediately. All right. So, you can go through this later. You can choose your style, go through the website, look at the component, see what helps, uh, what suits your style the best and drag and drop the code from there. Follow the documentation. This is completely open source. There's no problem with copyright and all that using these libraries. The thing is open source, I repeat. So if you want to build complicated websites, you know, suppose your website, I was talking to you about making your website behave more like an Android or iOS app, you know, where it has access to the camera. It can change files on your phone. You know, it can detect the sensors. So uh, once you rotate, not just the website uh, rotates as a whole. Suppose you have a game built into the browser and the browser, you want to control the uh, car with the steering wheel effect using your gyroscope. It can do all of that. It can behave basically like an app, but it, it's been written with web technologies. So for that, we have React.js and AngularJS. I'll be talking about these towards the end once I introduce you to more and more uh, programming really. So we'll get to that in a while. So coming to the next part is the backend. Okay, backend is the same, you know, the same kind of programming languages you use on your desktop, you know, what you've been learning uh, so far in college as well, they'll come here. My recommendations really are to get started with JavaScript and Python. Okay, in JavaScript, we have this runtime called Node.js that allows you to bundle a lot of libraries, okay, to add a lot of functionality. So within Node.js, you know, what a backend does really is, I'll show you an example of it. So let's go to Twitter. Okay, I've 
I'm going to Twitter.com. So immediately it shows my feed and all that, shows what's trending, you know, all that. So you can notice the address bar over here. Address bar over here. You see that it's Twitter.com slash home. Okay. So if I were to remove the home part of it, it will still go back to the Twitter homepage. Okay. And then all of this HTML is loaded and CSS adds all the style. So if I were to change this to suppose here, I press notifications. You see that even the URL changes. This is what we call routing essentially. So in the backend, what you control is routing. Okay. So if I went to uh, you know profile, again, the URL changes to my profile name. All right. So the backend really controls this routing. So the logic works in this way that when I go to twitter.com slash home, uh, it sends a request to your server. That is the backend. In the backend, then it realizes, okay, this person is trying to access the home. So it will create an HTML file with all the information that you need. That is your feed, you know, uh, people you're following and each and every post along with its likes and dislikes, all that is returned. And then that is sent back to you as an HTML file. So that is what we use, uh, you know, these uh, frameworks over here, Express.js. Express.js is what I use most frequently for my JavaScript de uh, development, really. Really handy, you can create all your, <clears throat> what do you say, routes and all that. You can categorize them by routes. So you say, okay, if the person goes into the profile section, immediately send a database request. We'll get into databases in a short bit. Send a database request, return his personal details, make that into a beautiful HTML file that has already been declared by you and send it back. So then if you're a Python programmer, usually my entire focus is usually on recommending Python and JavaScript because those are the most flexible and easy to get started with languages. Then you can go into the complicated languages like C++, which require much more in-depth understanding of programming as a whole. But most of your uh, IT jobs and computer science stuff can be done with uh, JavaScript and Python. So over at Python, so if you're implementing machine learning models, we all know that machine learning can really be done only through Python. Okay. At, at least on a beginner level, you can only do it using Python. So if you want to serve your machine learning, uh, data. So in this case, uh, we were talking about the Google example. Here. So here I press the speech button. Okay. <clears throat> it records an audio sample. This is done through JavaScript. There'll be a JavaScript library that will ca capture whatever you say, audio file and send it to the server on the server. There'll be a machine learning model that'll probably be implemented in Python 90% uh, of the times. That Python, uh, you know, module will convert it from speech to text, from audio to text, and then send it back. So in this case, what happens is you either have to find out a way to make JavaScript and Python talk. Okay. If you want to separate your servers in that way, which I do most of the time, but if you want it, uh, if you feel that, you know, it is convenient to implement it in one language, and then you can build your backend in Python for that. You have Django, Flask and Sanic. <clears throat> One crucial uh, factor is that Django, it actually comes with its own admin page where you can actually get uh, a website. Once you create the server itself, it'll create a, a landing page for you. From there, you can create your own uh, databases and all that without entering commands. You can manage a lot of things. It gives you a dashboard. Okay. It's convenient in that way. This Flask and Sanic are more about, you know, everything you do it from scratch. So people like me who like to do everything from scratch, you can prefer this. Django is more beginner friendly. It's the same with Express JS. Be beginner friendly and Strapi in between is again like Django. It gives you a dashboard and all that so you can manage your content. You can look at your databases because databases are again very difficult to work with on a beginner level. All right. We'll get into databases now. See, if you don't understand everything I say immediately, uh, do understand uh, that the focus of this video is not giving you information about what Node.js is, what uh, Django is. It's about telling you, it is about giving you awareness that these kind of technologies exist out there that can make certain tasks easier. That is what I want you to focus on. Please don't focus on what does what, but focus on what all is possible through this particular programming language and its frameworks. Okay. So if I say Python, you already know you can do machine learning, you can do web development. A lot of people don't realize you can do web development with Python. Most of people I've spoken to don't realize that you can do web development with Python. So I, don't want you to look at a programming language and think it can't do this. It can't do that because you haven't been exposed to that on that level in your syllabus. So please get this over. Next up is databases. Databases, anybody who's worked with Excel will know what databases are really. It's basically a table. You'll store some information. I have a sample table over here. So it says, you know, I'm just storing the ID of the person that is in which order their uh, name was inserted, the name and home. 
So in this case, you know, I have Batman, Superman, Iron Man, and Captain America because uh, comic fanboy. So I have their home cities listed over here. And then I have another table, okay, in which I show um, for each person with their unique ID over here. ID has to be unique. Okay, you could also put their phone number here because no two people in a database will have the same phone number in most of the cases, unless you are taking landline numbers for a reason. Or you can put their emails. That will uniquely identify them. So with that, I'm saying that you know this ID number one, which is Batman, has 20 followers. Then how many fo- how many people is he following? Zero. You can link these tables in real time. This is what relational databases are. That is what SQL. Uh, that is SQL. It's actually pronounced SQL. That is what SQL is used for. Okay, you create structures of these tables. You put them, and then you know through your front end. So the same information. Just go back to your Twitter example. So Batman is a Batman has a Twitter account. You know, at Batman suppose. So you'll have his personal information. How many people is following? How many followers does he have? All of this, if it were on a MySQL database, this is how it would be probably stored. Okay, and then you would have another table that says people who are followed by Batman. Okay, you have. Fancy ways of modeling all that. You can put everything in one table, or you can split it up so that it's easier to update and all that. These are design choices that you learn over time with experience. This is why I emphasize that you choose a project and build project. Only then will you get hands-on experience. Otherwise, it's usually the textbook examples and the exam point of view questions that don't give you real-time exposure. Anyways, we'll go to the next one. So I hope SQL is clear to you. And the next one is NoSQL. Okay. The most common example here is MongoDB. It's almost like synonymous with NoSQL. Okay, here uh, this is for more not strictly complicated but unorganized data. Okay, in this case we already know uh, what kind of data we're going to put in what kind of tables. So we've already given structures. To it. Suppose you have a table where relationships between tables is very very complicated. So assume there's a person Alice, okay, who is a friend of Bob. Okay, you're trying to represent. This is represented in the graph for a reason. Okay, and Bob is also a person. Alice is also a person because you have to uh, differentiate between them. Okay, on Twitter you have bots as well. Apart from real people, then you have verified accounts and all of that. Okay, and then you track interests of people. You know, this is done on Instagram and Facebook. That is how recommendation works. So they'll say, okay, is it interested in Mona Lisa? And then uh, some more information about Mona Lisa would be like, you no, know, was it, who painted it? So Leonardo da Vinci. And then where is where is it from and all that? And now if it he wasn't interested in uh, Mona Lisa, suppose suppose he was interested in the movie, suppose he was interested in the Avengers, then it would be like directed by Joss Whedon. And then who is Joss Whedon? And then which uh, studio produced it? You can see this uh, graph will become very complicated once you try to store a lot of information, which is the goal of social media. Really, you have to store a lot of relationships. And remember, Bob and Alice are not the only people who are friends with each other. Alice has her own uh, entire. Uh, friend list and all that. So this mesh becomes really complicated really quickly, and it is kind of difficult to implement on a beginner level into tables using this SQL structure. You can just imagine how many tables it goes into. Then for friends of each, and then when you have to track the things like this, this part, you know, the right side, Mona Lisa, and things they are interested in. It could be a person it could be interested in Mona Lisa, the person. Suppose there's a person in Mona Lisa, and then there's painting Mona Lisa. And there could be a fan club that is called the Mona Lisa fan club. Okay, each of them have different properties. Okay, uh, the Mona Lisa fan club could be uh, made by someone. I mean, the group could have been started by someone else. That person has friends. So that is how this entire this data is totally unstructured. For those kind of things, we have MongoDB, no SQL really. So once you look at a few examples, the databases are something that you are supposed to get into through projects because uh, the examples that you give uh, that. That are given to you in textbooks and all that is not really representative of the whole thing, because with MongoDB I can build the same tables as well. Okay, so once you make the same table, you you don't really know what is the difference. That is where people start picking favorites and all that. The thing is, I want you to know where what is important. So MongoDB would most likely be used for machine learning and all that. See, uh, I'll just give you a nice introduction to uh, machine learning as well. So it's like I know Bob and Alice are interested in Mona Lisa. So, how many people in uh, Bob and uh, Alice's friends group are also interested in Mona Lisa? So, usually, people uh, we have the saying that birds of the same feather flock together, right? That is because people with common interests they all bond together. So, what Facebook or Instagram would do is knowing your interests and the interests of your friends, and based on the interests of your friends, it would 
probably think you also share the same interest and recommend that content to you send you that post from that tiktoker over there to your feed and if you don't like it it'll remove that from your list so that is how all of this is managed this is done in real time for machine learning and all that so when your data really doesn't have a proper structure it's no secret it's common machine learning pipelines and all that anyway again hybrid approaches that i was referring to that can make your website work like an app we'll get to that next is desktop this is where i actually emphasize that people get started in case you are in engineering and you want to go through the engineering route without disrupting your uh, whatever knowledge you have uh, gained in college so far without disturbing that suppose you are in second year you can't really start picking python or javascript midway and that will disturb your portion and all that okay your understanding of java and all that, that it could hinder because you are trying to spend a lot of time on that so if you are going to learn java okay you will you will have to learn java if you are learning java then you can pick something called c sharp the reason why i recommend c sharp to a few people is that because c sharp has a good uh, what do you say ecosystem within my uh, windows within windows so if you use c sharp you can actually build a uh, desktop apps for windows like you know this cisco webex app that we are using right now it's implemented using uwp protocols so you can build you have technologies like wpf and uwp uwp is what you have to focus on if you want to develop on windows suppose uh, with uwp which stands for universal windows platform you can develop apps same code you write the code only once you can develop the same app for xbox so you can make a game youtube for xbox is implemented that way and then uh, you can implement the same code on windows phone suppose your uh, customer base for some reason uses windows phone you can do that and then they have their windows 10x platform and all that so this code will work everywhere this is something that saves time just imagine if you have to write an app at the end for xbox or something when you know you're going to push it on xbox so that is how a lot of games are implemented as well these days that are supported on both windows and xbox so both of them are owned by microsoft next is you learn unity and unreal engine these are for building games and i do focus on games because that is what is interesting to a lot of people and they can get started quickly they can imagine a lot of things they can implement a lot more features because they play some games they get inspired by that they want to add those features that is where creative juices start pumping really all right so that is for people who are into the java type of languages so you can pick java or c sharp even in java you can build apps you know java also has this advantage where if you made an application a desktop application you can use the same application you can execute it on mac windows and linux without any code changes you just have to export that uh, project you have to compile that project to support the platform so you write the same code effectively and you only press run with certain parameters to execute it on other platform so that is how java is really convenient in that so we come to the next one which is python and c++ both of them are very similar you will understand later why they are very similar in some ways while they don't look similar at all a lot of people want to learn python because they are interested in machine learning really okay so if you are interested in python we'll slow, slowly start with you know where all can python be used you know really you can use it for automation you can use it uh, use it for visualization data manipulation you know whatever you can do in microsoft excel is possible with python as well if you're good with python so some of the libraries that you can use is uh tkinter which is used for building user interfaces you know uh, if you use java through netbeans before you have this user interface where you can drag and drop buttons and all that if you used android studio you will know you'll have the uh, you'll have a box over there and you can drag and drop all your uh, menus or buttons images whatever you want configure slightly that is how uh, tkinter actually allows you to create uis as well next is pygame this is for making very simple two dimensional or three dimensional games in python again you can have fun with this there's a lot of uh, implementations you can find snake pin ping pong and all those common games and then you can mix and match whatever code you want then you have tensorflow which is made by google which is for machine learning and then you have pytorch made by facebook which is again for machine learning this is they're not, not strictly for machine learning really they are used for creating computational graphs okay that's an advanced concept the real thing is they can perform complicated math operations very simply that is the real purpose of tensorflow and pytorch really they can perform complicated math operations we also use them for machine learning because they have some built in functions next is pandas numpy and matplotlib these three are what i refer to as you can do everything possible in excel through these three if you can if you're good enough with them pandas is like you know the same way you structure data in excel you know through cells and all that 
allows you to store data that way within Python. And you can even load Excel files as CSV files, and then you can modify them. That is how you feed them to machine learning models and all. NumPy will have all your mathematical functions, max, min, round, and all that. Okay, and uh, then you have another library called random for random numbers. Matplotlib is for plotting graphs and all that. All right. So you can pr plot graphs. So when you're doing machine learning, you want to know how much your efficiency, accuracies, losses, all that. So you can plot graphs and all that. And then you can use graphs for everything else as well. Stock market, uh, you, to see sentiments and all that. You can use these as well. So Python is, you know, one of the biggest languages right now because a lot of new technologies have Python implementations, okay? So a lot of people get into Python and JavaScript on the other hand is dominant because the web will never go away. See, even if you have uh, Android keeps growing, iOS keeps growing, you'll never reach a point where web technologies are completely replaced by uh, pure Android and iOS apps. That will never happen. Websites will keep uh, existing. For that reason, JavaScript will keep on existing. You know, ASP.NET and PHP also will exist. I don't really recommend PHP because right now uh, it's very difficult to find resources for it and get started really. Complicated language that hasn't been updated properly to be beginner friendly right now. Anyway, that aside. So if you want to learn for the web, go for JavaScript. If you want to do backend stuff and also web with some conveniences, Python. That is what I wanted uh, to drive home. Next is mobile. A lot of people like mobile because again, like the website, you can just send someone an APK file or you can put it on Play Store and everyone can download it and you can become an overnight success as well. Yeah, we've read all these stories before. You know, some 10 year old kid will make an Android game and he becomes an overnight success. He's the CEO of another company in two or three days after that because the company gets purchased by Google or something or some huge company, then another company gives him an invite. So that is where all the popularity for Android and iOS come. So when it comes to Android, you really have two options for implementing, uh, you know, the traditional way you use it through Kotlin or Java. So people who know Java will all, always go for, uh, you know, the Java way of implementation. You can learn Kotlin as well. Kotlin is again on demand. Kotlin is uh, very well preferred by a lot of people. And then th there's not much difference. Kotlin is just more new and then has a lot of support building up over time. And then for iOS, Swift is again new. I have put a Kotlin and Swift above the predecessors because they're new and there's a lot of functionality that uh, Google and Apple are really pushing into these two. So there's higher adoption. There's a lot of support coming to them. For iOS, you have Swift and uh, 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 can hear you. Yeah, yeah, my sir. My sir? Yeah, no problem. Go on. Okay, all right. Mm, fine, fine. Uh, anyway, so you, if you're working in a company, let's just all of us just assume that we are uh, working in a company. We are making a to-do list and reminder app. Okay, so it's like uh, I'll set reminders for tomorrow. My, my mother's birthday. I'll set a reminder on that day. So that I get reminded so that I can wish her immediately instead of forgetting because in this lockdown, you're frankly losing the concept of time altogether. So we are building that service. So you have to make a website because some people use it through the website and then website has its own marketing advantages and all that. Then you have to build an Android and iOS app because a lot of people use them. Desktop app, you can skip that because there's a website already. In most cases, you can skip it or you can add it. So it's like, uh, and if you are a startup, you have limited uh, funds and it's not easy to find people who do a lot of things at once. You can't find a person for cheap money, at least who can build both Android and iOS apps, you know, in Kotlin and Swift separate. So we have some hybrid approaches. Okay. Uh, one that I use uh, particularly is Flutter. Okay. Flutter, uh, it uses a language. It's a fairly new language in the market. It's been around for a long time, but it's picking up traction now because of Flutter. So it's called Dart. It is very, very similar to Java. It is super similar to Java. Uh, with Flutter, what you can do is, you know, just like Universal Windows Platform or UWP as referring to earlier, where you could write one uh, application, it will run on Xbox, Windows, HoloLens, and all Microsoft products that have come around since 2014. So Flutter is like, you can write the same code, you can write one app, it will run on 
on the PC, okay, on Mac and all that. It'll run as website. It'll run as um, one second. Uh, you can control just a second. All right. It was like uh, with Flutter, you can create the Android app, iOS app. All of this is generated from the same code base you've written. The same as with React Native. I was talking about React JS earlier. React JS and React Native have both been developed by Facebook. Okay. So you have that good support. Flutter is developed by Google. Okay. So big companies are backing this, and a lot of other companies are going on to this because even if you're a super uh, huge company, which is worth $1, uh, $1 trillion or something. You still cannot afford to put separate teams on applications for everything. Because imagine if you're Google, you have a lot of applications to develop and maintain. You have Google Maps, you have Google Keep, Google Drive. Google Drive itself again has Sheets and all that. So many applications. And for each, if you're maintaining an Android, iOS, and web development team, it's very uh, it's a very costly solution. And then management is a nightmare. You have to track all changes, bugs, and all that. So for that case, we use Flutter and React Native really. Flutter is new and much more preferable. React Native is based around JavaScript, just like uh, React.js. So the thing is, if you know React.js, you can write React Native uh, applications very uh, easily. There's some amount of modification done for mobile optimized stuff. But Flutter is where you can really build beautiful looking user interfaces. I'll show you a Flutter app that I've built later on into the session. Actually, I'll uh, show it to you right now. Fine. So. Hope the app is visible this is through the emulator. So I've built this very simple Flutter application for my startup that I'm doing during the lockdown. So in Flutter, it's like you can drag and drop code for Google login immediately. So I just press sign in over here. It'll select my account because there's only one account here. It'll select that and immediately sign in as well. Great. I don't have my applications on. Uh, just a second. I think I'll demo that app in a short bit. Yes. All right. So here it is. So this this is the app I was working on. So the other app I was working on, Draggy, the chatbot thing. So it's not connected to my development server right now because I'm making some changes. I was coding it even before the session. So it's like you can have a profile view, uh, you can delete chats and all that. All this looks neat when compared to a website. I'll show you the website version of it later. You can start chatting as well. So that is the whole thing. You know, Flutter looks really good. Okay, when compared to the other solutions. Sure, Kotlin and Swift implemented pure Android and iOS apps will always look good. But Flutter makes it very simple to write beautiful user interfaces. So if you want to create apps that look really good, because it's not just about your ability to create apps, it's also about your ability to make good looking apps because your uh, users not understand complicated user interfaces like you and I as software engineers you understand. All right, anyway. We'll get to the next one, okay? Hybrid approaches, this is what I was talking about. You know, Flutter is an example and React is an example. So here you can look at Google's uh, browser uh, browser version, which is uh, google.com. And then you can also look at the Google app on uh, Android and iOS over here. Both of them look the same. There's slight differences. Like you have the Google navigation here from Android. Here, you, iOS doesn't really have uh, navigation buttons anymore. So they have swipe gestures. So they actually put this uh, back and forward button search buttons over here. Everything else looks the same, really. Some design changes here and there. So it looks more like an iOS app. And this one looks more like an Android app. There's some changes. They can use React JS and React Native to create Android and iOS applications as well as website. I do little code changes. Flutter will do all three perfectly for you. And then if you want to build something for uh, the desktop, you can use something called Electron JS, which will make your app behave like it's a desktop application and it's actually a website. So this is one way you can code smartly these days because being a programmer, uh, suppose you're a machine learning programmer, okay, you're doing machine learning and all, machine learning engineering. You are building a lot of machine learning uh, models and all. You have to showcase it to the world. So you need to have some ability to create some app or some websites or you can demo it. So in these cases, you cannot create a perfectly written uh, Kotlin app and then again under the uh, Swift implemented uh, app for iOS. You can use these hybrid approaches and get pro uh, prototyping quickly. Anyways, so the section is for the people who joined late or people who could not follow through the whole thing because this is quite technical, okay? Anyway, so if you want to learn something, okay, this is usually uh, where I counsel people. Uh, if they just want to build something, okay, they know what they want to build. 
Use Python if you want machine learning, data, data science, and all that. JavaScript if you're doing anything related to web, and you can do Android application, Android application development, iOS uh, application development. So if you are starting uh, fresh, if you don't have any previous experience in programming languages, pick any one of those two. You can literally roll a die and do that if you do not know what project you want to build. I know some people want to learn a little bit of the language, then get an idea of what they can do, and then they can decide what project to build. So you can choose one of these. All you need to know is that your domain knowledge as a programmer is more important, you know, than your ability to write code. Okay. Anyway, I'll just end the technical part of the session. Okay. I'll end the technical part of the session. I'll, what I'll tell is that right now, I'll tell you a few things that I've been observing so far uh, after my interactions in college, you know, with engineering students, my seniors, people who've been working in the industry for a long time, people who've been working in the industry for a short time, people who just got hired and all that. Real uh, problem a lot of people think is that uh, you need to know a lot of languages, you need to write perfect code, okay? So it's like, you have search programs. I'm pretty sure every department uh, has already heard of binary search and bubble sort in first year already. So they're like, okay, we give you a lab exam. The lab exam you're supposed to implement it, okay, within half an hour, write it on paper, then execute it on the system. If you have some errors in the system, somehow try to fix it. So the real focus is, uh, the thing is it becomes more like math. The way they deal with it, it becomes more like math. So they're like, you have to do exactly this, you have to do exactly that, and you have to do it in this amount of time. Always remember, there are smarter people than you and me. There are smarter people than you and me who have already implemented bubble sort, binary search, and all that in C, in Python, you know, Python came out in 1991. I'm pretty sure 1991, the next day itself, people started implementing binary search and all that. Because that is how, uh, you know, that is how common they are used, or commonly they're used in every application we use on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? Just imagine, on Instagram, you're searching for someone, okay? Uh, you're searching someone's name, you start typing first two characters of the name. Immediately, there's a search happening, okay? or you're seeing how many uh, likes or dislikes you have, all of that, everywhere the search, sorting, and all that is involved. So people have already implemented all of this. Your focus as a programmer should not be on how to implement the perfect code, you know, in all of these weird conditions. It's about developing that skill where you know exactly what tool is used where. Again, coming back to the entire focus of the video, I mean, uh, the webinar, being that, People do not look at programming languages as tools. They look at them as subjects and try to master them in depth. So remember, this is not medicine. This is You're not trying to be a doctor. Doctor needs to understand anatomy. He needs to understand the entire human body before you can start practicing and learning real things. If, if you want to be a dentist and all that, you start learning then into your uh, dental sciences and all that. That is, how, uh, that is not how programming works. You just need to understand how computers work in, to a certain degree. And then just pick a programming language, find your problem, you know. So I want to build a website, I'll search for web frameworks uh, in JavaScript because I'm doing it in JavaScript, or I'll search for it in Java, or I'll search for PHP, you'll find something in Laravel or something, and then you start building. So you need to know, all you need to do is, see, remember, you are more like an architect. An architect will have his own set of uh, engineers under him. Those engineers will really implement, uh, they are like tools to him. There's one engineer who purely work on the foundation and uh, structures of uh, the building. There's another engineer who will do the electronics and all that, you know, wiring and all that. There's someone who does, uh, you know, civil engineers do all the actual construction material choices and all that. Okay. So you need to pick programming languages. You need to know which programming language is optimal for your use case. That judgment is what you're supposed to work on. That is the point I want you to take home. Even if you're not able to write code properly, uh, you just need to develop the ability to be able to search for the code that you need. In the sense, you need to grow an understanding. You need to grow uh, that, you need to know that overview. You need to have that overview of programming as a whole. You need to know what all tools exist, what tool does what, and then all you need to know is how to use that tool in the end of the day. And be perfect at any programming language. Frankly, we don't really know. Uh, when a new programming language will come into market, almost every alternate day, someone or the other will create a new compiler and create a new programming language. Right now, Python is like so everywhere. And uh, recently, last year, they got something called Julia, which is trying to be a Python killer, which is really good in some ways than Python, but then it doesn't have community support. But we never know 10 years what happens. It probably might become another underdog, which is like the second best programming language in, Python, in, the, in that category, suppose, for machine learning. 
So we never know. So you can't keep going back to college or university every time a new language comes in and start asking your teachers to teach you that language from scratch. The uh, habit that you have to develop is about self-learning. That is, you have to go look for the documentation, search for uh, websites like Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is where every programmer on the planet who works in software or who is learning, like you and me as hobbyists or people like me who have been entrepreneurs for a long time trying to implement apps and all that. Those people, they post their doubts over there, then people respond, they provide source code as well. All your problems, usually if you have a problem in computer science, you can find the answer on Stack Overflow. Then use Quora sometimes, I don't really have anything against Quora, but it's not optimal for software engineering, it's optimal for every other uh, concept out there. I mean, every other field out there, Quora is optimal. Stack Overflow is just built for computer science, sharing code and all that. Create a GitHub account, you know, look at some projects, look at how they're implemented, look at the way people are thinking about problems, how they're modeling that problem. So if I tell you, oh, I want this app, you need to know, immediately start visualizing what all technologies you might need. Okay, will this person need an Android app? What is that and all that? To-do list app, that is the example I gave. Right? You need to immediately know what kind of people would be using and where they would be using it. And then you need to determine what kind of requirements you have, what kind of languages you'll be using. So use this cheat sheet probably, okay, to learn. And the other implementation is that keep this as a reference forever. Okay, when someone asks you to build a desktop app and you've already been, or you've only been building web websites for a long time, you can have a look at this cheat sheet and then tutorials for everything. So all of these are clip clickable links. They all link to tutorials that I've followed personally with great success. Okay, always go there. So the real point is you have to focus on teaching yourself, okay? Because computer science is probably one of the uh, most rapidly evolving industry right now, uh, apart from medicine really, where new knowledge is added every day, new papers are published, new frameworks are released. Okay, a couple of years later, people won't even probably be using Django because something new came into the market, which is much more convenient than Django. So that is how it is. So that is where I want to leave you guys. Okay, please look at programming languages as tools, not as a subject or a discipline that you have to perfect perfectly, you know, with 99% and all that. Do that for the academics. Uh, uh, when you do it practically in a job, uh, it's not really practical. If you guys have questions now, I'll open up for questions. Just enter your uh, questions in the chat, or if you have a mic, uh, please speak into the mic. I'll respond to the questions. We're open for questions. Is anybody ready to ask a question? Yeah, all the participants, if you have any questions, please do type in the chat box so that the Sushrut can answer. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Sir, can you deliver uh, hello bright about the uh, Pi game? Pi game, sure. Just a second. Uh, uh, Maestro, what is this annotation request that I keep getting? Like uh, someone wants to access your screen, uh, uh, don't accept it. Just reject it. Okay, okay. Anyway, uh, so you want me to talk about Pi game, right? All right. Let's go there. Pi game, I personally not used it as much. I used it in my beginner days where I was trying to just have fun with Python really. My game will allow you to it'll give you, it's more like, have you used a turtle or some program like that before, which is for drawing using commands. You have like forward 90 and all that. Have you used it before? I'll, yeah, turtle or something like that. Response. Okay, I'll just go along. So what Pygame gives you, it's like, it gives you drawing tools, it lets you control the cursor, it lets you draw lines and all that. And using that, you can create some classes, objects for that. You know, you can make a, what to say, suppose you're making a ping pong game, okay? With that you need two paddles, each paddle will be a rectangle. So you can draw rectangles, you can define the shapes, you know, with the marker and all that. You can define the shape, you can add rounded corners or whatever. And then you can control their movements horizontally. You can have them interact with each other. That is how you write the code. So that's what Pygame is called. It's suitable for 2D games like, you know, 
these things super mario and all i've seen people implement super mario and by game as well. any kind of 2d games is fun and then we also use pygame in time so to test our machine learning algorithms because it will immediately integrate with python itself right all right uh, so that is what pygame is really okay i have some questions in the uh, chat i'll just go through them once yeah yeah i'll provide this guide uh, towards the end of the video i'll provide the link uh, i'll just send that um okay eighth grade students fine eighth grade students really are the tldr section is for them okay because they don't have any programming uh, background i'll just assume that they have no programming background so in that case they can choose python or javascript see most kids have this uh, i know because i have been there because most kids want to showcase whatever they build you know first you show it to your mom and dad next you want to show it to your friends so the best way to showcase something is through websites so i would say you know showcase whatever through websites and for that javascript is really preferable unless they want to build something you know like games and all that then can you go there uh, all right so that is what i wanted to say about that question it's on a javascript it's really up to the uh, kid but you can start the javascript because they can uh, uh, develop an interest in web development and all that okay so there's someone asking about examples of bootstrap fine i will get to that in case you have some clarifications about the answers i'm giving you can again hit me up so bootstrap really suppose we have some html okay i'll just do a uh, type some code for you guys then not html wait a few seconds all right first you put some html i put some body okay. now i just say logo so this just prints it this way hello and all that normally i could add some more uh, tags to it bold and all that and put html in between the text in between comes bold and you can add some input tags and all that with bootstrap what really becomes convenient is that you can take the same code drag and drop it over here take this code drop it over here okay in this case i haven't loaded bootstrap into this directly all you have to do is go here go to the getting started uh, section okay you can add this css style sheet over here okay within the head or you can add bootstrap files you just download that and you add that and see how the button changes all together okay we'll just move this line for a second see you see the difference so whatever components you have every component on bootstrap you know uh, let's just add something fancy let's add an entire form okay for a complicated form you can see this form looks complicated so put in the body and then paste this now look at this now if i remove the bootstrap i can also add my own css okay that is also possible the thing about bootstrap is you can get started quickly you know instead of spending another week learning css you can use bootstrap all right uh, so i hope this example is clear enough so i'll get back to the other questions so this a uh, simple programming language uh, that they can understand logic okay when it comes to a very simple programming language i would always suggest python because unlike c unlike c which has pointers uh, and very very um, uh, variable types and all that i would always suggest python because python doesn't care if your data is declared as an integer or what it dynamically understand what is going on so can start with python in that that matter because python is simpler to get started to and there's so much support online there's so many good uh, uh, channels out there that cover python for free there's some resources here as well i'll link to a channel called sendex you can just click the link over here uh, you i usually recommend this channel because all the code is uh, available as well free to access no paid course on the, all that and then you can pick a uh, this thing uh, course online next up so how did i manage to learn these tools while being a student okay, this is a question that is very common to me 
thing is i started very early so this is cheating in in a sense i didn't start when i was in engineering i started when i was in second or third grade i was doing python programs and as playing games and all that i was hacking some games no hacking and not in the sense of cracking games and all that as changing scores so that i could yeah. back to my friends that i was a, as better at the games than them so it's essentially like playing chrome dino i'll just show you an example of what i was doing right you have this game you have high score every time all i'll do is i'll modify some code over here that is how i started really I just do this, and it runs. You just see four seventy four immediately. It just boosted speed altogether. And if it was in Chrome, I mean Vivaldi, you keep going forever. That's a bug in that. Sometimes you fix it, sometimes you don't. So that is how I got interested in coding. Then slowly I picked up a few other languages. That is when I started C plus plus. Before the before that I was hacking with Python. Then I thought C plus plus was interesting because everybody is talking about it. Then I realized that Python is really suitable for me with machine learning and all that. All right. Uh, so there's another question. You know, uh, it's about Eclipse and NetBeans. Yeah. Whenever you start coding, please don't learn on a notepad. This is one thing I wanted to get across. Do not learn to code on a notepad because notepad does not have auto complete. Uh, you might have seen me while I'm doing this over here. I was working this HTML file. Just pressing Control Space and it would show me whatever uh, you know tags are possible after this. I just press button. Okay. It will complete the code block for me immediately. it's very convenient see the thing is coding is dry okay you want to make it as easy and and fun as possible for you eclipse netbeans visual studio code which i'm using over here all of these make it very easy and then when you come for java programming in netbeans netbeans has a drag and drop uh, editor where you can drop uh, form elements and all that like i was dropping code for uh, bootstrap over here bootstrap components instead the thing is you have a toolbar right over there that has buttons and all that you just drop them edit the uh, properties to some extent and then ready to go you can add functions so an ide like netbeans and eclipse is very very convenient whenever you learn please learn on ides do not you know think that uh, implementing in notepad makes you a superior programmer in most cases it will make you frustrated and uh, make you quit that language altogether all right uh, without having a knowledge of C C plus plus, but having Python, especially for other branches than C S C, like mechanical engineers, is it possible to get a job? Yes, really. Ah, uh, so if you're in mechanical engineering, um, I don't know the names of the software especially, but uh, I'll just do some general uh, generalization. So you will have a lot of simulation and fluid dynamics and all that. I assume. So for that, we use Blender and all that. I I uh, your CAD CAM software is different. We use Blender sometimes in machine learning for simulations and all that. really connects well with python so if you're able to learn things in your domain that are related to your domain okay like simulations and all that then if you're able to connect that with your python knowledge because implementation of that c in c++ is really possible but it will be very difficult to get done quickly python is prototype friendly python and javascript are prototype friendly some mistakes that you made will not affect your entire program but c++ is like very stubborn c++ java very stubborn about having the code look exactly perfect okay so yes if you're a mechanical engineer or if you're an electronics uh, engineer you can work on things like arduino and all that i'm pretty sure itp already has arduino workshops and all that where they teach you how to do arduino programming you know uh, with servo motors sensors and all that lidar and all that so uh, any department really any field of engineering med- medicine or accounting anything can be automated using python javascript or any programming language really but i recommend python and javascript because they're very simple and they have lot of reach and everybody knows them instead if you went uh, with some new language that nobody recognizes they do not even probably have evaluation criteria to evaluate so yes you can learn python and you, you have lot of scope mechanical engineers can implement simulations and all that way better than we can okay without disturbing academics yes um <clears throat> without disturbing academics this is really important because see i told you i learned uh, coding uh, early on itself but then i was also learning new frameworks and all that it is important that you keep updating your knowledge about frameworks even if you don't use a framework just have an overview so when you are doing academics 
one thing is learn to separate work from play and uh, work from learning as well work here would be definition uh, in this definition would be academics okay that is your uh, responsibility as a student to get grades and all that complete your assignments and all that so set some time apart okay suppose you're doing uh, you have, i'll just assume you're in first year and you're doing c you have c work and all that you're learning c uh, faculty has sent you some resources and all that you're learning all that okay and then later on you feel that because you know you've learned something new today fell statements for loops or something like that or you learn classes and all that try uh, search for uh, c projects online just be like you know a pro- cool projects in c a uh, beginner level advanced level depending on your level and try implementing that even if you end up copy pasting a lot of code what you'll understand is what is c capable of beyond the hello world programs that are introduced in the first next week they'll teach you loops and all that in week after that they'll teach you searching sorting and all that so you could probably use it okay in that way so the thing is learn by example seriously uh, learn by implementing learn by example look at a lot of people sometimes you can just look at some person coding live you can get a lot of inspiration you not code 24/7 you can look at some inspirational channels you know i follow a lot of them you know i follow the tech lead and all of them they give good computer advice they code sometimes they do live coding sessions you get uh, motivated or if you like something you can implement that as well okay bye yeah um, Uh, Mysura will share the video after the session, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. We'll be uploading in the YouTube channels. Uh, one is our uh, Shreyas Institute, and the another one is IIT Shreyas Student Branch. And I request all the participants to drop down their mails in the chat box so that we can send you the feedback form on this session. And Deeraj, over to you. Yeah, yeah there's one thing. Uh, Deeraj, just a second. We participate. So. Someone is yeah, privately yeah. messaging me for a second here. Uh, they wanted to see how React and these things compare. React and Flutter. So I've already shown you Flutter, right? So let's just show you people uh, re- uh, React, React JS. So I've made the startup recently in uh, during the lockdown. So so I've implemented that using React JS. So I'll just show you how a desktop application would look really in React JS. All right. so this is how the application looks on pc you can see that this doesn't really look that good on pc okay it looks like a random landing page the form size is very small and all that but when i open it on a website i mean uh, on my phone this is how it would look okay yeah, this looks much more mobile friendly now this is what you are used to right so this is how react is really good for that you can create responsive views using bootstrap bootstrap is fairly capable here i've used something on material ui that i've shown you uh, this is like the second example after bootstrap i used that to implement this entire interface that is uh, you can even implement this in bootstrap it looks different i just like this aesthetic it looks more like a mobile app there. so whatever complicated uh, i'll show you what kind of logic you'll be working with normally in an app so what i did was i created this app there's some google sign in required then you have a form so every time i press this there's a date sorry Uh, I just press back by mistake. Anyway, so every time you open this form, it'll send a database query. That database has a list of all the states. So I just press, you know, Telangana. Goes into Telangana. Then after Telangana, you'll find out what is next. So keep selecting. Uh, that is how database queries work in real time, really. Uh, and then you select store. And then my whole thing is about booking slots because all of us are stuck at home right now. so you can book slots to local grocery stores and all that it will generate a ticket for you by so decide 1 pm or 2 pm just book that generate a ticket you show it to the cops and you go access it so this is something i prototyped within one week that is how convenient it was for me to do it and react if i were to do it using uh, traditional web technologies using only pure html css and javascript without react js to take me over uh, you know 2 3 weeks to get everything in order so that is one example i can give you in real time because everything i'm recommending here is from my own practical experience with it nothing is really from some google article or something i found fancy everything i've used at some point of time and have found convenient or sometimes i don't use them anymore because i found better alternatives that is what i wanted to say about the uh, choices i've presented here so if you guys have any other questions or uh, teeraj can take over like uh, i think uh, deeraj lost the connection sure so, okay uh, so do you have time will you wait for the questions few more or tell me yeah i'm ready for questions that is fine 
or participants if you have any questions we have more two minutes so we can ask now and uh, meanwhile Shushu, uh, can you post some of the uh, like beginner links for the coding yeah yeah definitely i'll just uh, link you to that i can post it in the chat itself right yeah 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 so i'll just put that over here all right created and show up as the entire thing right. you can just copy that link and paste it it'll take you here everything is interactive the same way you can paste like a fancy word document in the end okay so you click on any of the links immediately it will take you to the tutorial that i was referring to just a second so suppose you want to learn python because someone was asking me for beginner tutorials uh, Python immediately it goes into that tab. It goes into the playlist that I was referring to before. This entire playlist is really enough for someone uh, who wants to learn Python. Okay, someone wants to know a name of a, main, a website where I, you can learn Python for free. Okay, so this channel over here, Syntax that I referred to, it actually has a website which is really good for Python. So it's called PythonProgramming.net. It's also linked in the show notes, uh, the document I just linked to. So he has it like a core structure. Everything is uh free over here yeah just a second i'll send that link again thing is it has a space in the name okay i'll just uh send it once again i'll send it to everyone's mails okay i'll just send it once again anyway uh so this is where you can find your python resources by category so here there's game development this is where i learned pi game from as well and then there's web development Okay, and then again, we break it down module by module. You can learn framework by framework here. That is what happens. So that, that is a good website. And for JavaScript, there is Traversy Media. You can refer to that. He has very good content on, and he's a very good uh, web developer who's been working with Node.js for a very, very long time. Okay. And I'll uh, share this as well. One second. Anyways, any other questions? Okay, uh, Mysura, they want the feedback um link yeah i will send them to their mails yeah dheeraj go on yeah thanks to each and everyone uh, for attending this webinar special thank thanks to mr sushrut thank you for this wonderful and very productive session it's a privilege to have you here i'd like to again thank ieee hyderabad section ieee hyderabad computer society and ieee shreya student branch our hod's principal sir and constant support for management and participants kindly drop your mail ids in the chat box before leaving so that we could share the feedback forms with you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dheeraj. And uh, once again, we request all the participants to share their mail IDs in the chat box and you can leave. Like, share thank you so much, Sushrut. A privilege to have you here. Yeah, please do drop your mail before leaving.